While they were erecting a low barrier of the wire on the section of the west bank of the Tanaru facing the sand spit, Kodria's men were interrupted in their work by a tall, older gentleman who approached them and was observing their performance. Without introducing himself, he asked Kodria to describe the specific tasks in stringing the wire. Nodding approval of the young officer's response, the visitor then began walking towards the upper Tanaru. Only later did Kodria realise that it had been Major General Vandergrift who had been querying him. He'd never seen his commanding officer before. It had come as a surprise to E Company's men when a jeep arrived in the late afternoon, pulling a load of barbed wire. Their CO, Captain Rockmore, informed them that they were going to have to string the wire along the west bank of the Tanaru. As dusk approached, Portet Charlie Royer and others of 2nd Lieutenant Dean Stover's 1st Platoon, joined by men in John Williams's 3rd Platoon and Harold Pierce's Weapons Platoon, began the disagreeable work. CPL Lugene Chestnut and his Weapons Platoon squad were bitching the whole time as they worked alongside the other E Company men and those of Codria, setting up the apron in the sand spit area before moving upstream to string a single strand as the stock of wire began running out. No sooner had E Company's men completed the wire erection operation than Captain Rockmore designated two of the platoons to serve as the regular defence line that night along the Tanaru, from the mouth as far upstream as the bridge that division engineers had recently constructed across the west branch of the river. At dusk, 2nd Lieutenant Dean Stover and his acting platoon sergeant, Fred Wilburn, led the 1st platoon's men upstream and spread them out in positions on the west bank up to the location of the bridge, while 2nd Lieutenant John Williams and his platoon sergeant, Arthur Simon, positioned the 3rd platoon's men in two-man foxholes to the left of the 1st platoon on the west bank in the area of the sand spit. Williams's platoon was to provide protection for the two machine guns of Rivers and Warren, should the Japanese choose to come across the stream. But the E Company men were not the only riflemen moved to emplacements dug along the Tanaru for duty that evening. After finishing his late afternoon meal, 2nd Lieutenant Don Wheaton led some 50 men of his H Company mortar platoon down to foxholes on the west bank of the Tanaru along a 300-yard front. The men selected for this still patrol were considered surplus to the needs of their four 81mm mortar squads. After they were deployed, Wheaton relaxed and started writing a letter to his parents in the dim light. His foxhole faced out to the disabled Amtrak in the river. The departure of PFCs. Murray Battles and Clyde Lucas for patrol duty at the Tanaru left their squad leader, PFC John Tatum, with just two men besides himself to operate their number four gun. That morning, Tatum's crew, along with those of the three other mortars, had been shifted about 500 yards forward towards the Tanaru from their old position. Tatum now had about a 150-yard front for his base gun, on which the other three 81mm mortars were aligned. Set up near Tatum were CPL, AM Jack Dalton's squad on number three gun, CPL, Jim Young's crew on number two gun, and PFC John Mugno on number one gun with his men. All four mortar crews were now starting to dig new emplacements for their guns, around which they would be stacking Japanese sandbags to protect them. But before Battles and Lucas had headed out, the four mortar squads were startled, it was about 1600, by the deafening roar of aircraft overhead that made the earth tremble with their vibrations. Assuming they were Japanese, they all ran to their foxholes for safety. Then one of the men screamed, American! Sid Phillips looked up to see grey-blue single-engine aircraft with the white star insignia under their wings and with the others, went absolutely wild with joy. The pilots and rear gunners had their canopies back and were waving at them as they banked in a circle, now very low overhead. Our morale soared. They were not to be abandoned on the godforsaken island after all, Phillips and the others realised. All up and down the marine perimeter, the officers and men of Pollock's 2nd Battalion were standing and waving their hands, including Pollock himself, who was so damn glad to see the American planes. Lieutenant Bill Horf was overpowered by the joy of being able to fight those damn Japanese bombers, he recorded in his diary that day. All the way west to the Longa, 
Regimental Intelligence Officer George Hunt had just scrubbed himself clean while bathing in the Lunga River when he heard the distant drone of aircraft becoming a deep-throated roar and looked up to see a flight of Grumman F4F Wildcats zooming over the coconut palms and banking steeply towards the airfield. Approaching higher, a flight of SBD Dauntless dive bombers then also circled and came into land. Hunt mused that his boss, Colonel Cates, had won his $5 bet that American planes would arrive that day. In addition to the newly arrived marine aircraft that could be used for attacking any Japanese force opposing them, Colonel Cates also had the support of the artillery of the 11th Marines 3rd Battalion assigned to his 1st Regiment. The battalion's G, H and I batteries, each with four 75mm pack howitzers, were positioned to the west of the upper Tanaru and south of the airfield. Earlier that day, the battalion reconnaissance officer, 1st Lieutenant John Frothingham, had run a survey from the mouth of the Tanaru back to the Fire Direction Centre, FDC, at battalion headquarters. With the topographic data collected, the FDC now could assign new targets to the three batteries to compute revised firing data. Provided with new registration points, Lieutenant Colonel James Keating's battalion was now in a position to lay down fires in front of Pollock's 2nd Battalion dug in along the Tanaru. To ensure telephone communications with Cates, PFC William White and the others of his battalion wire section had double-routed a line from the battalion's FDC to the 11th Marines liaison officer at Cates's command post, as well as a line to the forward observation post that 2nd Lieutenant Brooks Johnson of I Battery had set up on the west bank of Alligator Creek, a few hundred yards upstream. But I Battery's other forward observer, 2nd Lieutenant Gil Small, was still in his post on the beach with Cates's 3rd Battalion. However, to Small's east, H Battery's Nat Mewinney was positioned at his OP at the edge of the coconut grove just in from the beach, with the Tanaru on his right. H Battery's other forward observer, 2nd Lieutenant Herb Clark, remained at his post on the beach. For Sergeant Bob Askey and the other nine men of his I Battery, anticipating an imminent Japanese attack, there was a foreboding air around their position that afternoon. Then, at about 1600, on order from the battalion's FDC, I Battery's executive officer, 1st Lieutenant John Bradbury, called out, Fire mission! Askey and the other three section chiefs of the four-pack howitzers yelled back to Bradbury, standing within earshot, that they were ready to fire. Earlier, Bradbury had laid Askey's number one gun on an azimuth of about 800 mils, with the others aligned on its axis. Askey's gunner fired six sighting rounds, then ceased fire. Satisfied with the test firing, Bradbury now ordered his section chiefs to stand down, but remain on alert. Along with those of G and H batteries, I Battery's 75mm pack howitzers were now ready to be fired with effect on the numbered concentrations on the sand spit and across the Tanaru. Departing their bivouac area at Mikhail, on schedule at 2000, Captain Sawada's men led the Ichiki Detachment's column as they proceeded down the north coast of Guadalcanal, heading west. After covering 3.2 miles, they arrived at the east bank of the Higashigawa, the real Tenaru River, and halted. It was now 2200 on a moonless night. There, the Japanese were met by the scout from Lieutenant Goto's engineer company, who had been reconnoitring the river as ordered earlier. The scout reported that one of the three native guides who had accompanied him had escaped. Colonel Ichiki was not getting much cooperation from the natives. The one they had captured at Makil and hung in a tree at Gaimale had refused to divulge any information about the marines. At dusk, conscious again after his earlier beatings, he had been lowered from the tree and with his wrists tied, taken with Ichiki's men when they left their bivouac at Mikhail for the attack. With Captain Sawada's second company still in the lead, Ichiki's detachment forded the Higashigawa at the point recommended by the scout. It was slow going as the long train of troops, stretched out about 380 yards, trudged along the beach in column in pitch darkness, heading west for the next river, the Hebigawa, Block 4 River. At about midnight, having forded the Hebigawa, the lead platoon of Sawada's company, under 2nd Lieutenant Goro Ohashi, reached a point about a hundred yards short of the mouth of the Nakagawa.
Suddenly it was fired on by an automatic rifle. A forward outpost, Ohashi realized immediately. But before his men could return fire, the Americans began withdrawing, in a hurry. Good. Attack them while they are pulling back. Follow me. Ohashi ordered his men and took off running, the others following behind. But soon their feet began sinking in the sand, impeding their forward movement. Then they heard flowing water. The river, Ohashi realized. At that moment, Ohashi saw something rise in the sky, turning darkness into bright light. Lie down, he ordered his men, all momentarily blinded. He figured that the Americans were aware of their approach and had sent up flares to illuminate them. Ohashi gave his platoon ten minutes to rest and to let their eyes adjust to the bright light. It was frustrating for him to see the flares still shooting up in the sky and lighting up everything in the area as if it were noon. He noted that towards its mouth the river before them seemed not very wide and figured the men of the American outpost must have crossed it at that point. Surely we can cross it there too, he thought. But of course Captain Sawada and probably Battalion Commander Major Kuramoto would want to observe the location themselves before making such a decision. Accordingly, Ohashi dispatched a runner to go back and find Captain Sawada. By the light of the flares, he could make out from his watch that it was now 0030. At midnight, asleep on the ground behind their foxholes, which extended from the sandbar up the Tanaru PFCs. Les Sapp and Cecil Powell and others in Lieutenant John Williams's 3rd Platoon E Company were suddenly woken by the sound of gunfire and screams coming from across the river. They had not been on alert that evening, but now they quickly got up and headed for their assigned foxholes, where they had positioned their packs and Springfield rifles. Privates Bill Mosner and George Terzai didn't need to move. With Mosner on guard duty, they had been in the two-man foxholes some twenty feet back of the Tanaru's west bank and two hundred feet upstream that they had dug earlier that evening. The gunfire and screams had awoken them too, but now everything was quiet again. Some 750 yards west of Williams's men, at his command post, Lieutenant Col Al Pollock knew what was up. He had received a report from his F Company commander, Captain John Howland, that the men of Howland's two-man listening post on the other side of the Tanaru had just returned with the news that Japanese had run into their position. To Pollock, this was the first indication that the Japanese to the east would be coming. He had approved Howland's sending out men in rubber boats to set up listening posts across the Tanaru, but provided they just listen and see if they could detect any advances by the Japanese, a scary operation in his estimation. But evidently Persheet Frank Wilson, whom they all called Chicken because of his diminutive size, which contrasted with the great big bar that he carried, had fired on the Japanese who had approached him. Also in their foxholes, somewhat further upstream than the men of Williams's platoon, the H Company men assigned to still patrol this evening under Lieutenant Don Wheaton had been ordered earlier to stand by your guns. PCA Jim Donahue wondered, was this going to be the real test? Buddy PFC Clyde Lucas, warned by his squad leader, CPLL Charles Carp, that the Japanese would hit about 0030, was concerned that they would come across the river at the point where he had a good position to fire his 03 Springfield from his foxhole. Perseet's Claude Crotty and Harold Punchy Legraf were also ready for action in their two-man foxholes lined with their ponchos. Like the others, they had heard the firing and noise emanating from downstream of their foxholes. It seemed to them that a sentry had challenged someone. All of a sudden, the moonless sky burst into blinding light that bathed the marines in the sandbar area in an eerie, ghostly green brightness. Flares? they realised. Moments before it had been so dark that they could not see more than a few feet ahead, but now they could even make out men moving in groups on the other side of the river. Who fired those flares? they wondered. Us or the Japanese? but all knew that the battle was on now. After making his way forward to reach the east bank of the Nakagawa River, Alligator Creek, Captain Tetsuro Sawada crouched down next to his second platoon leader, Second Lieutenant Goro Ohashi. In the light of the flares going off overhead, 
Ichiki's second company commander was trying to decide whether they should cross over. It seemed to Sawada that the water depth was shallower near the mouth of the river. Further up the Nakagawa, the flow was slow and it looked marshy. But did that mean it was shallow there too? It was impossible to be sure of the situation just by observation. But Sawada would have to make a decision. Only by trying to ford the river would they know what conditions were like. He now opted for the mouth. Sawada ordered Ohashi and his men to cross over at the shallow point and rush the enemy position on the opposite bank. When Ohashi made it across in his platoon's assault, the rest of the second company would follow, Sawada added in his instructions to Ohashi. Jumping up, Ohashi yelled to his men, Forward! Follow me! Sword in hand, he raced forward and plunged into the water at the mouth of the Nakagawa, the thirty-five men in his platoon following behind. The water was indeed shallow, only about a foot deep. Thinking only of attack as he joined the others, PFC Masaharu Hayashi surged ahead. Suddenly, the higher ground to their left on the opposite bank erupted in a cluster of sparks as flares once again lit up the night sky. A line of unrelenting machine gun fire was extending in an arc like crimson blossoms around the Japanese. Streams of tracer bullets, as bright as searchlights, illuminated the point as they cut into the hapless men. Hit, Hayashi fell in midstream. As he lay prostrate in the shallow water, three of his comrades following behind, who had not been knocked down, stepped on his back and jumped over him. The groans of the fallen filled his ears. Observing the scene from the eastern bank of the Nakagawa, Captain Sawada could make out that at least some of Ohashi's men had succeeded in running the gauntlet, and had managed to reach the opposite bank despite the withering fire. Turning, he yelled to a member of his first platoon detailed for training as a runner. Private First Class Mizuno, cross over to the other bank. Find out the situation of Lieutenant Ohashi's platoon and report back to me. After succeeding in getting across without being hit by gunfire, which had now died down, Mamoru Mizuno realised that the remnants of the platoon had turned left on reaching the opposite bank. He kept running in that direction and soon spotted Ohashi himself. Mizuno called out, Lieutenant Ohashi, sir! He could see that Ohashi was wounded. Only a few members of his platoon were around him, the others apparently killed or seriously wounded. Mizuno himself had now taken a hit and was pretty much out of it. However, he could understand that Ohashi was ordering him to report back to Captain Sawada that it was hopeless to attack this way against such a hail of fire. Mizuno, quick, go back! Ohashi yelled. Sensing a lull in the firing, Mizuno made his way undetected back to the mouth of the river and crossed over. Half dead, he reported to Second Company headquarters that Ohashi's platoon was virtually wiped out. Sawada agreed with Ohashi's assessment as related to him by Mizuno. To continue attempting to force a passage in a column of four through the narrow throat against an enemy in established positions with heavy interlocking firepower would be inviting another slaughter. Instead, he realised that a better approach would be to spread the troops in battle array along the east bank of the Nakagawa to draw fire from the opposite side, so as to give away the positions of the enemy and disclose its strength and firepower at different points. And Sawada intended to press his argument before the battalion commander, Major Nobuo Kuramoto. But in his meeting with Kuramoto, Sawada failed to convince his battalion commander of the wisdom of his position. A methodical and earnest type, Kuramoto lacked any actual combat experience, unlike Sawada, who had fought at Nomenhan in 1939. Kuramoto wanted to make a personal reconnaissance of the crossing point used by Lieutenant Ohashi. Despite Sawada's protests that it was too dangerous for him to do so personally, Kuramoto was adamant. Sawada Company will take cover and provide protective fire, he ordered. Accompanied by his adjutant, First Lieutenant Naoyuki Kondo, and a runner, Kuramoto made his way quickly to the crossing point. In the light of flares overhead, the battalion commander and his adjutant studied the topography of the position. Sawada's men were providing them covering fire, but from the other side a continuous blaze of fire streaked across to their side. Sawada, in the rear, was following the movements of his commander, now almost out of sight, 
Suddenly he made out that Kuramoto had thrown back his head and fallen prostrate on the sandy bank. Kondo appeared to Sawada to have somersaulted and fallen head over heels next to Kuramoto. The Major has been wounded, Sawada cried out to his men. We must carry him to the rear as quickly as possible. Sergeant Takuchi, take some men and help the Major back. Everyone else, provide covering fire. Crawling forward, with Takuchi and his men following directly behind, Sawada reached the beach point where Kuramoto, Kondo and the runner had fallen. He found them all dead, apparently killed instantly. Kuramoto had been hit in the chest, while Kondo had taken a round in his skull. Dragging Kuramoto's body, Sawada crawled back. When he reached a safe point, Sawada stood up and carried his commanding officer to his second company headquarters location, where he laid Kuramoto down. Viewing the body, Sawada's men were stunned to see that the life of such a prominent man had ended so quickly. Within seconds of hearing a rifle shot, Sia Pluppel Glenn Campbell at his 37mm gun position facing across to the sandspit was face to face with his platoon sergeant, Nelson Breitmeyer. Follow me, Breitmeyer ordered Campbell and Piusit Fred Augustinowitz of his gun crew. Hurrying to the road that led to the sand spit, they ran into Piusit Claire Hume of Corporal Olive's gun crew, whose 37mm gun was to the left of Campbell's. Hume told Breitmeyer that he had fired on someone while he was standing guard duty in his foxhole in front of his gun. To check out the situation, Breitmeyer, Campbell and Augustinowitz turned to head out to their end of the sand spit, where they were confronted with the strands of barbed wire set up that afternoon. The Russian and Campbell went down on one knee as Breitmeyer crouched over them with his forty-five pistol drawn. Suddenly they heard a loud explosion behind them. Campbell could tell it was near his gun position. But now there came the noise of screaming men emanating from the far side of the spit. Here they come! Breitmeyer yelled. That was no place to be. The three men fired a few rounds in the direction of the onrushing Japanese, then ran back to the marine line. In his two-man foxhole just to the left of the 30 caliber heavy machine gun position 100 yards upstream, Pirtit Peter Martuscelli, a BR man in Lieutenant John Williams's E Company platoon, had seen the Japanese too, moving in groups on the other, lower side of the river. As the Japanese began crossing the sand spit, Martuscelli heard them yelling, Prepare to die, American Marine! And F.K. Babe Ruth! What did they have against Babe Ruth? he wondered. To Martuscelli, it seemed everyone on the Marine's side now started to fire. The men on the Browning water-cooled machine gun to his right were firing tracers really close past his foxhole. It was unnerving, but Martuscelli realised that they had traversed their machine gun to the left to be able to fire on the Japanese crossing the spit. Sipol Leroy Diamond and his gun crew on the machine gun were not worrying about Martuscelli when they pushed the sandbags away from the front of their machine gun to get a clear shot at the spit by tilting the gun downward in its tripod and traversing it to the left. Then Diamond yelled, Fire! and his gunner, Jack Rivers, opened up. To assistant gunner Al Schmid, the Japanese appeared as a dark, bobbing mass, like a bunch of cows coming down to drink. As his gun chattered, raking the Japanese at a rate of 125 rounds a minute, Rivers could see that they were breaking up into a lot of little shadows and shapes, screaming and running and flopping down in the shallow water over the sand spit. Rivers soon realised that his was not the only machine gun firing at the Japanese crossing the spit. He could hear the chug-chug of the air-cooled machine gun to his left, firing .50 calibre rounds at a slower rate. Unprotected in his two-man foxhole dug in the ground except for a few sandbags, PFC. Elmer Slim Fairchild of the 1st Special Weapons Battalion was directing his fire to the left across the sand spit too, with P-Sheet Angelo Catullo sharing the foxhole with him, feeding belts of ammunition into the gun. The two men of the gun crew were pleased to see their tracers smouldering and lighting up the sand spit as they hit into the sand just below the water. To Rivers's right, some 100 yards further upstream, Bull Warren's 30 caliber Browning water-cooled machine gun had now also opened up on the Japanese. Paired with Rivers's team, Warren's gun crew in their covered emplacement 
had traversed the gun to the maximum to the left to be able to reach the easternmost part of the sand spit. Up on the corner of the ocean and the mouth of the Tanaru, Persifit Andy Dillman was also set to fire his water-cooled .30 caliber Browning, one of the four of Lieutenant Hugh Corrigan's platoon. His was in the best position of all the heavy machine guns of H Company to oppose the Japanese now charging across the sand spit directly opposite their gun. But when he pulled back the bolt and squeezed the trigger, nothing happened. Momentarily stunned by his gun's failure to fire, Dillman reacted quickly and opened the cover to check the ammo belt. Too late. In the darkness, Dillman could make out a Japanese soldier with a bayonet on his rifle looking into the opening for the gun. Then he felt a sharp jab in his left arm and shoulder. An explosion sent fragments flying in the narrow confines of the emplacement. The Japanese had thrown a grenade through the opening too. Squad leader C. Plutle Steve Boykin and assistant gunner Pastor Joel Hogerland made for the exit of the emplacement, with Dillman last out behind them. Boykin was injured by the grenade, and Dillman wounded by it in the right knee. Dillman dove into his foxhole behind the gun emplacement and put his head down. He could not find his rifle. He could feel the warm blood from his arm, shoulder and leg soaking through his uniform. Japanese were shouting all around him, and sporadic firing was coming from all directions. Suddenly, a body landed right on top of him. Terrified, Dillman yelled, Quill! Quill! Hoping the unexpected arrival was a fellow Marine. Are you OK? his new foxhole mate asked. No, I've been hit, Dillman replied. Without identifying himself, the Marine gave Dillman his first aid kit and moved on. Dillman took out a bandage and tried to slow the bleeding from his shoulder wound. His leg hurt from the wound caused by the grenade. There seemed to be confusion all around, but he kept quiet and still in the foxhole. Some Japanese had managed to get across the spit and penetrate the Marine's line, but fortunately there were more Marine voices than Japanese. Nearby, Hoagland was also hunkered down in a foxhole left unoccupied by squad mate PFC, Jesse Bohr. He had fired Bohr's rifle to deter Japanese from trying to block the exit of Boykin and Dillman from the emplacement after the grenade explosion. Earlier, as Boykin and Dillman had been attempting to fix their gun before the Japanese assault, Hoagland had been firing a rising submachine gun on the Japanese he had seen approaching before it jammed, and he had joined his squad mates in getting out of the emplacement. Further back on the beach and to the left of Dillman's machine gun emplacement, C. Plal Mel Burge and his 37mm gun crew had spotted the Japanese heading towards Dillman's gun and their own position. It seemed to Burge that there were about 20 or 30 of them. He and his crew reacted quickly, loading and firing canister shells, mowing the enemy down before they could reach their rearward position. Some 20 yards to the right of Dillman's machine gun position, Part Hugh K and C. P. Lil Jim Olive in the dugout behind their own 37mm gun emplacement heard a Japanese in front of their position yell Quill and head for them. Both K with an 03 Springfield rifle and Olive, armed with a rising, fired, and the Japanese fell dead. To them, it looked as if about three or four Japanese had managed to get across the sand spit, despite the withering machine gun and canister fire ripping into them as they headed in Olive and Kay's direction, directly opposite the spit. From his foxhole in front of the gun, squadmate Claire Hume was also firing on the Japanese with his rifle. As soon as Kay and Olive felled the Japanese, they climbed out of their dugout and headed for their 37mm gun. There they found Puffit Patrick Sweeney, who had just shot two of the other Japanese who had penetrated into the gun emplacement. With Pershut Irv Moore, Olive, Kay and Sweeney began firing canister from their gun, but could only partly bear on the spit. Their gun was emplaced to fire out to sea and could not be traversed far enough to the right, but to their right the 37mm gun of C plus Glen Campbell was in a direct line of fire to the sand spit, yet it wasn't firing. A grenade, apparently fired from a Japanese 50mm knee mortar, had landed in the gun pit, spraying fragments among the crew. Knocked down PFC. Tom Palmer was hit in the back in several places from the neck down to the knee. Peter Al Locke suffered wounds in his right leg and foot, 
while poet Eugene Stevenson, like Palmer, was hit in the back. Palmer managed to climb out of the emplacement, but shortly afterward, a second grenade exploded, its pieces breaking his shoulder blade. Rushing back to their gun emplacement after the diversion to the sand spit, Campbell and Fred Augustinowitz jumped into the pit, only to find it empty. Trying to work the gun, they couldn't load it with the canister shells. The breech block handle was stuck, impossible to release. Campbell now realised that the explosion he'd heard behind him while at the spit must have been from a grenade landing in the pit. But where were the men of his gun crew? Asking around in the dark, Campbell was informed by someone that they were all dead or wounded. Lying on the ground in the dark, out of sight of Campbell, Palmer was in acute pain from his wounds. After about five minutes, a corpsman came up to him and gave him a morphine shot. This is going to hurt, the corpsman warned Palmer, who managed a weak smile in response. But he was then left lying on the ground. Up at the sand spit, 18-year-old Percy George Terzai of Lieutenant John Williams's E Company platoon was confronted with seven Japanese who had managed to evade the machine gun fire of Rivers, Warren and Fairchild, as well as the canister fire of Burge, and had knocked down the barbed wire at the Marine's west bank end of the spit. Working the bolt and trigger on his Springfield rifle as fast as he could, Terzai shot five of them with the five rounds in his rifle as he lay prone. But the two others were about to bayonet him. Rising, Terzai parried a bayonet thrust of the first one, but nearly lost his left pinky in the action. Evidently confused in the darkness of the melee, the second Japanese inadvertently drove his bayonet into his comrade. Terzai smashed him in the face with his rifle butt, and he fell back into the river. With no more Japanese attacking him, Terzai turned back to his foxhole to get more ammunition. To the right of Terzai's foxhole, a bit further up the river, PFC Les Sap and his foxhole buddy, PFC Jim Dolan, did not encounter any of the Japanese who had succeeded in crossing over the sand spit. But others in CPL Elmer Pappy Potts's squad, positioned closer to the spit like Terzai, fired their five rounds from their rifles, then fixed bayonets to meet the onrushing enemy. Perverts, Gil Doloff and Dean Red Wallace nearby were also firing at the Japanese who were coming at them through the shallow water over the sand spit. In his foxhole at the mouth of Alligator Creek, right at what would soon be called Hell's Point, Pursuit Brady Wadsworth felt no fear, just anger, as he confronted other Japanese with his bar. The twenty-year-old native of Lufkin, Texas, somehow managed to evade injury as his fast-firing automatic rifle tore into the onrushing enemy in short bursts. But he couldn't tell in the darkness how many he had felled. Pursuit Jim Edlin in Bob McMillan's squad was less fortunate, only about 30 minutes into the fighting, he was fatally shot by a sniper who had gotten through the defence line of Williams's platoon. The Japanese had climbed a coconut palm and hit Edlin in the back with a single shot from his Arisaka rifle. Still stunned by the deaths of Major Kuramoto and First Lieutenant Kondo, as well as the apparent annihilation of Lieutenant Ohashi's platoon, Captain Sawada left his second company headquarters position to look for Colonel Ichiki and report the disastrous developments. He did not have to go far to the rear. Ichiki had advanced his detachment headquarters to a location just behind Kuramoto's battalion command post. Sawada repeated the argument he had presented in vain earlier to Kuramoto. To charge the Marines' defences en masse would just lead to a repetition of what had happened to Ohashi's men. Some had managed to get across the sand spit, but he didn't know of any success they may have had in attacking enemy positions before being felled by the Americans. The detachment would have to be reinforced to have any chance for victory. He pleaded with Ichiki to delay any further attack while considering the pros and cons of the situation. Ichiki grunted non-committedly as he listened to Sawada's appeal, his adjutant, Captain Yokichi Togashi, at his side. I fully understand your opinion, but no matter what, there is no choice but to attack, Ichiki then responded. Sawada swallowed his chagrin. He knew there could be no opposing the expressed will of a superior. Knowing Ichiki well, Togashi also elected to remain silent. Ichiki now declared that he himself would assume command of Kuramoto's battalion, 
At this point, Sawada asked Ichiki if he would be allowed to show the detachment commander the Nakagawa crossing location. Sawada would be the guide. Ichiki acceded to his request, and with Togashi and Sawada disappeared in the darkness, moving westward. The remaining units of the detachment remained assembled, waiting for eventual orders. Observing the sandbar from his vantage point on the east bank of the Nakagawa, Ichiki felt this was the easiest way to get across to the other side. Single-minded in his determination to seize the airfield, no matter what stood in his way, Ichiki again dismissed Sawada's advice, apparently unconvinced of the deadliness of the marine firepower that would be opposing his men. After all, it was infantry doctrine to march to the enemy's position and charge through any obstacle. Of course, some sacrifices would be inevitable, as in the case of Ohashi's platoon. Sawada had clung to his battle-tested argument that the enemy's firepower must first be suppressed with an artillery barrage for the Japanese to be able to close with the Marines in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the latter the core of the fighting doctrine of the Japanese army. But Ichiki had dismissed Sawada's latest entreaty. He knew the only artillery his first echelon had was the 270mm battalion guns in the rear. His detachment's 475mm regimental guns had been left behind with the second echelon. His mind made up to cross over the sand spit, Ichiki had to decide which of his units should be selected to make the second attempt. Again, he felt a single platoon should suffice, despite the lamentable experience of Ohashi and his men. At any rate, the platoon should not be from Sawada's company, Ichiki decided. Already it had lost the leader of its first platoon, Lieutenant Hagyuda, in the Shibuya disaster, and now the second platoon leader, Ohashi, and his men in the first attempt to cross over the Nakagawa. That left only second Lieutenant Tatsuo Tanaka and his third platoon, and Ichiki did not want to run the risk of having Sawada's crack second company wiped out completely. No, he opted for one of the two remaining platoon leaders in First Lieutenant Yusaku Higuchi's first company as the logical choice. Unlike Second Lieutenant Tadayoshi Uchizawa, Second Lieutenant Yuzo Kudo had combat experience at Nomonhan, and for that reason he was favoured by Ichiki following an exchange of views between the detachment commander and Sawada. Approaching Lieutenant Higuchi, Ichiki informed the company commander that Kudo and his second platoon had been selected to make the second attempt to cross the sand spit and seize marine gun emplacements. Stoically, Kudo accepted his fate and bid farewell to Higuchi, then set out with his thirty-some men for the mouth of the Nakagawa. He knew he was confronting death, but he had no fear of it. Such was the tradition of the Japanese army. Asleep in the tent at his battalion command post, some one hundred yards inland from the ocean beach, Lieutenant Colonel Pollock was awakened by the sound of gunfire to the east. Then, shortly afterwards, he had unexpected visitors. A member of his G Company, in reserve upstream that evening, had brought in a native through the lines. The badly wounded black man identified himself as Sergeant Major Jacob Vuza of the local police. At about the same time, coast watcher Martin Clemens arrived in his jeep, a dog riding on the hood. Clemens translated Vuza's pidgin English for Pollock. It was quite a story. According to Vuza, he had been captured by the Japanese the day before. They had tied him to a tree and tried to get information about the marine defences from him. When he refused to cooperate, they made him lie on a nest of red ants. When Ichiki's force moved forward that night, they took Vuza with them. The Japanese halted just short of the mouth of Alligator Creek. Still unable to force Vuza to provide information, the soldier serving as his escort thrust a bayonet under his armpit that exited his chest and into his throat, cutting his tongue. Then the Japanese jabbed his bayonet again under his armpit and into his chest. But Vuza was determined not to help the Japanese, even at the expense of his life. He was left lying down at the mouth of Alligator Creek, with Japanese soldiers stretched out next to him. As the Japanese began charging across the sand spit, Vuza, who was assumed to be dead, rose up and ran away in the dark. No one chased him. He was of little interest to Ichiki's men now. After working his way about a thousand yards down the eastern bank of Alligator Creek, he turned right and crossed over towards the American defence line on the other side,
A Marine spotted him in the dark and challenged him, but when Vuza kept walking, PFC Wilbur Bewley shouted, Stop where you are or you're a dead SOB. No shoot, me no Japanese, Vuza called out. Bewley realised he was a native when he raised his hands. Not authorised to leave his two-man listening post, the G Company Marine turned Vuza over to his squad leader, C. Pelk Elias Hontz, who took Vuza forward to the 2nd Battalion command post. Before he was taken away to a field hospital for treatment of his wounds, Vuza gave Clemens and Pollock a description of the Japanese force, including its numbers and weapons. He estimated that there were about 2,000 of them. As Vuza related his experiences, the sound of firing to the east had died down. But when Clemens was telephoning the information provided by Vuza to Division Intelligence, to which he was attached, as he sheltered behind a tree, a bullet struck his jeep. The sounds of firing were picking up again. Pollock decided to go down to Alligator Creek to determine what the situation was. On arrival at Hell's Point, Pollock found that the gunfire of the Marines had ceased after the last of those Japanese who had managed to get through to the line in their charge across the sand spit had been dispatched. American wounded were being taken by medics back to the field hospital under the supervision of the battalion's surgeon, US Navy Lieutenant Robert Goldstein, whom Pollock had sent down to Hell's Point earlier. But anticipating a renewed attack, the defenders were now attempting to improve their defences where possible. In his 37mm gun emplacement, CPLL Jim Olive, frustrated at being unable to have the gun bear on the sand spit rather than the ocean, ordered his crew to move the gun out and emplace it in a position where they would be able to fire on the Japanese should they come across the sandbar again. Olive, Pat Sweeney and Hugh Kay, joined by C. Plebel Toby Cogswell of Regimental Intelligence, who had come forward from his listening post, tore out the sandbags on the left flank and enough on the right to be able to pull the gun up and out of the emplacement backwards and turn it to the right to face the sand spit. But now the gun was in the open, its shield providing the only protection for his men. At the 37mm emplacement of C. Plebel Glen Campbell to the right, there was nothing much that could be done to restore the gun to operating condition after the grenade explosion. Nor was there any crew to man the gun. Almost all were wounded and subsequently evacuated, except for Tom Palmer, who was still lying unnoticed on the ground in the dark. With Fred Augustinowitz in the emplacement with him, Campbell was still trying to determine what damage had been done to the gun. Suddenly, Campbell was surprised to find the battery executive officer slithering down into the gun emplacement. Follow me, he ordered Campbell. The executive officer led Campbell and one other B battery man upstream about 75 yards, then had them turn inland about 100 yards to a big bomb crater. It turned out to be the Special Weapons Battalion's B battery command post, filled with non-combatant drivers, cooks and communications people. To his amazement, Campbell found that he was being ordered to defend the makeshift command post and shoot anyone who comes near. With Campbell's 37mm gun inoperative, the executive officer evidently figured that Campbell was more valuable defending the command post than remaining on the line. After drawing his sword, 2nd Lieutenant Yuzo Kudo stepped down onto the submerged sandbar at the eastern bank of the Nakagawa, to lead the four squads of his platoon in a charge across to the other side. At that moment, machine gun tracers of streaking light zeroed in on the men. Unmindful of the enemy fire, Kudo pressed ahead amid the machine gun fire and shotgun-like sprays of steel balls from a gun or guns facing the sand spit. Ten, twenty, thirty metres, and he was across to the opposite bank. But some of his men were wounded, and others had fallen on the sandbar, their blood staining the shallow water flowing over the sand spit. Suddenly, 23-year-old Kudo himself was hit and fell back into the water, mortally wounded. Back at Hell's Point, the night was now being punctuated again by screams as a second group of Japanese, Kudos, began their charge across the sand spit. Once more, Rivers, Warren and Fairchild opened up on them with their machine guns, joined this time by Olive's crew firing canister from their newly positioned 37mm gun. In Lieutenant Williams's E Company platoon, the riflemen were shooting towards the sandbar too, 
Brady Wadsworth began firing his BR at Japanese, who approached his foxhole, then seemingly turned back. Wadsworth was joined by Dean Wilson, who had remained out of his own foxhole and was also emptying his bar on the Japanese. Unable to see well in the dark, and fearing that with his ten-foot radius of fire he might hit E Company men near the sandbar, Claire Hume only fired two rounds of canister. Olive fired two more rounds before they stopped. The canister supply was also running low, but they could see the devastating effect of the steel balls being sprayed in a wide cone pattern at the hapless Japanese. It appeared to Olive's crew that none of the enemy had made it into the marine lines this time. After returning to his command post, Colonel Pollock instructed his executive officer, Major William E. Chalfant III, to go up to the front line to monitor the situation. But in the event, after spending only about ten minutes at Hell's Point, Chalfant returned and re-entered his huge foxhole covered with coconut palm logs. After watching the failed attack of Lieutenant Kudo's platoon, Colonel Ichiki was beginning to think that Captain Sawada's advice might have had merit. Headlong, rushing by lightly armed platoon strength infantry alone into the Marines' defence line would indeed not succeed, as two attempts had proven. He would need firepower to suppress the machine gun and 37mm gunfire of the Marines. This time he would use the heavy machine guns of 1st Lieutenant Shiganao Komatsu's machine gun company and call up his battalion gun platoon with its two 70mm guns to support a full-strength effort to cross the sand spit and break through the enemy line. He would also send an infantry company, supported by engineers, to cross over the Nakagawa upstream, also under cover of heavy machine gun fire. There was little alternative. If he pulled back, his men faced the prospect of starvation when their four-day rations were exhausted. After laboriously marching in the dark with their 87.7 mm Type 92, 1932, heavy machine guns from their rear position in Ichiki's detachment, the 109 men of 1st Lieutenant Shiganao Komatsu's company finally arrived at the coconut palms near the front, where they dropped, exhausted, to get rest. They could hear snapping sounds in the palms from gunfire flying by from the west, but it seemed only a minor engagement was going on. Their rest was short-lived. Orders had come from Ichiki to deploy their three machine-gun platoons on the left wing of the detachment, extending south from the mouth of the Nakagawa. Komatsu gave the order to move out. As the men slowly made their way through the coconut grove in darkness, they also began to reassemble their guns so as to be ready as soon as they reached their new positions. After finally emerging from the coconut plantation into an open area of the sandy bank of the Nakagawa, they found Colonel Ichiki standing there. He was waiting for Komatsu's men to set up their guns, which were needed to suppress American fire in support of Higuchi's and Chiba's companies, which he had selected to cross the sand spit at the mouth of the Nakagawa again. Following Komatsu's order, the three platoon leaders gave instructions to their squad leaders to begin preparing emplacements for their guns. They were to be spaced four to five metres apart over about 50 metres of the Nakagawa's east bank in a line and extending from a point some 70 metres upstream of the mouth of the river. On the far right, 2nd Lieutenant Kosoburo Osada's four squads of his 2nd platoon, each of ten men plus the squad leader, set up their four machine guns while to their left the 1st Platoon's 2nd Lieutenant Masao Inagaki positioned his two squads with one gun each. To his left, 2nd Lieutenant Zenji Ito's two squads of his 3rd Platoon had similarly emplaced their two guns. With all his guns emplaced, Komatsu took up his position at the centre of the line and waited for each of the platoon commanders to report their readiness to commence firing at the Americans across the Nakagawa, only an estimated 70 to 80 metres away. None of the gun emplacements were protected from enemy fire, having been set up hurriedly. Ichiki had also ordered the battalion gun platoon of 2nd Lieutenant Tatsuharu Hanami forward to provide further support for the main force attempt to cross the mouth of the Nakagawa. However, due to difficulties in lugging the two dismantled 70mm howitzers to the assembly area, only one of the Type 92, 1932 guns had so far arrived with its crew and Lieutenant Hanami. The second gun was stuck in the sandy soil, and its crew were still struggling to bring it forward.
other members of the fifty-man battery were spread out under the palms of the coconut grove. At any rate, Hanami had the number one gun in position to fire, under the command of Sergeant Tomita with his fourteen men. Observers moved out in front of their squat howitzer, prepared to guide the crew's fire. The platoon's fifteen-man ammunition squad was also in place, ready to feed seventy mm shells to Sergeant Tomita's gun. Poised to lead his first company over the sandbar in the vanguard of Ichiki's main force attack, First Lieutenant Yusaku Higuchi was going to attempt to move his men to the left once they had crossed over the Nakagawa's mouth. His company was considerably below its first echelon strength of 105 men and officers, having lost First Lieutenant Tate and some men of his first platoon in the Shibuya debacle, and Second Lieutenant Kudo and his whole second platoon in the second charge across the Nakagawa. But his company headquarters and Second Lieutenant Tadayoshi Uchizawa's third platoon so far had sustained no casualties. They would also be joined by the remnants of Captain Sawada's second company, ordered to make a frontal assault after crossing the sand spit. But Sawada's men would not be with their commanding officer. Captain Sawada was being held back by Ichiki following the death of the battalion commander, Major Kuramoto. Instead, Ichiki had decided to put First Lieutenant Toshiro Chiba, the commanding officer of his fourth company and a veteran of the Battle of Nomonhan, in charge of the whole attack force. Except for Second Lieutenant Kiyoshi Sato and his platoon, who had been left behind to dispose of the bodies of the Shibuya party, Chiba and his two other platoons now joined up behind Higuchi's and Sawada's men, plus two platoons from the engineer company, awaiting the order to attack. It was about 0300. Following behind the second and fourth platoons of First Lieutenant Hideo Goto's engineers, some of whom carried flamethrowers, First Lieutenant Higuchi shouting, Higuchi Company, attack, attack, took the lead of his men and headed for the sand spit. In columns of four, the infantrymen, bayonets fixed, began rushing through the shallow water of the sandbar under the light of flares. At the same time, the grenade discharger squads of Captain Sawada's platoons began firing 50 mm projectiles into the American machine gun and 37 mm gun positions that they had targeted. The eight heavy machine guns of First Lieutenant Komatsu's men opened up with 7.7 .7 mm fire against the locations of enemy gunfire opposite them. Joining in was Lieutenant Hanami's 70 mm howitzer. In Higuchi's company, Sea Plebel Tomotaru Asahi, a squad leader in the first platoon, was now leaderless after the death of its commander, First Lieutenant Tate, in the Shibuya disaster. Asahi had been ordered to blow up the barbed wire on the American side of the Nakagawa's mouth. Leading his squad, Asahi and his fourteen men plunged into the river just below the sand spit and waded through waist-deep water, carrying a three-foot Bangalore torpedo to destroy the wire. Flares overhead, illuminating their movement, filled the night sky, presumably fired by the Americans. More than crocodiles, Asahi feared being attacked by sharks. None of Asahi's men returned fire as American rounds ripped into them while they crossed the river. Somehow, Asahi made it to the far bank and reached the barbed wire. However, when he looked back, he was dismayed to see only two of his men had made it across safely. The others lay dead in the water. The man carrying the primer charge was one of the casualties, forcing Asahi to abandon his plan to destroy the wire, as the Bangalore torpedo wouldn't work without a primer. Determined to continue, Asahi decided to use the grenade-like charges his squad also carried. As he and his two surviving men tried to blow up the wire, Asahi was hit in the leg by American fire. Wounded but still mobile, Asahi told his men they should attempt to return to Taivu Point, where they had landed two nights earlier. Slowly, they backed away into the river and then stealthily made their way toward the ocean, hiding as the battle raged upstream. Also in Higuchi's company, 2nd Lieutenant Uchizawa's 3rd platoon brought up the rear. As Uchizawa led his men in the charge over the sandbar, he realised many of them were falling, struck by incoming fire. Then Uchizawa himself was hit several times and dropped, mortally wounded. Up ahead, his commanding officer, Higuchi, also took hits and fell dead. <laughs>
After First Lieutenant Komatsu reported to Ichiki that his company had completed preparations for firing their heavy machine guns, Ichiki ordered him to commence firing. Sergeant Masatoshi Mai, a squad leader in Second Lieutenant Osada's platoon, which was emplaced at the far right of the line, found it illogical to fire in the dark without being able to see their targets. Although their guns had flash hiders, their firing triggered more flares, giving away their positions. Nevertheless, Komatsu's men continued to fire round after round from their eight machine guns, feeding fresh strips of 37.7mm bullets into their guns after each strip was exhausted, in a concerted effort to suppress the Marines' firepower against the troops crossing the sand spit. Under the cover of concentrated machine gun fire from Komatsu's guns, 1st Lieutenant Toshiro Chiba led his 4th Company across the mouth of the Nakagawa. Joined by men from the engineer platoons of 1st Lieutenant Kichiro Nakamura and 2nd Lieutenant Fumio Baba, who hadn't crossed with Higuchi's company, the combined force faced devastating machine gun and 37mm canister fire. Despite this, many managed to get across the sand spit and through the barbed wire, thanks to the engineers cutting an opening. About ten men broke into the right wing of the Marines' defence line, hurling hand grenades at the 37mm gun and covered machine gun positions. However, Chiba and his two platoon leaders were killed, likely cut down by the relentless American machine gun fire. At Colonel Cates's regimental command post, First Lieutenant George Hunt and others were awakened after 0300 by the sound of intense gunfire, much louder than earlier in the night. They could hear the booming of mortars, the roar of 37mm guns, and the sharp crack of hand grenades. Even from their distance from the Tanaru, machine gun tracers fired from the east were cutting through the palm trees around them. Cates's executive officer, Lieutenant Colonel Frisby, called Lieutenant Colonel Pollock. What's the dope, Al? he asked. Pollock informed him that a message from the front indicated that at least 500 Japanese were assaulting over the sand spit. Seated outside his tent, with a phone in one hand and a cigarette holder in the other, Cates began issuing orders. He told Pollock, Hold till daylight, then we'll go get them. To his third battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Bill McKelvey, he ordered, Throw a company into the reserve line. After consulting with Major Robert Lucky, the commander of the 1st Special Weapons Battalion, Cates decided to call for an artillery barrage. At 0320, he instructed Lucky to phone the 3rd Battalion, 11th Marines, and request artillery concentration number 383, which would unleash 75 mm shells on the narrowest part of the sand spit near Pollock's defence line on the west bank of the Tanaru. With his orders given, Cates sat back and waited for dawn. Meanwhile, at his 2nd Battalion command post, Pollock called for reinforcements to respond to the Japanese breakthrough. He sent a runner to inform Captain James Sherman, commander of G Company, which was held in battalion reserve, to meet him near the mouth of the Tanaru with one platoon. At 0330, Pollock moved forward to wait for Sherman, but the arrival of Sherman's platoon seemed delayed. Earlier that day, Sherman had informed 2nd Lieutenant George Codrier that G Company was being held in reserve, and that Codria's first platoon was the company's reserve platoon. Codria then returned to his position in the coconut plantation, about 250 to 300 yards west of the sand spit, with the coastal road on his right, and passed the order to his NCOs. Following Pollock's order, Captain Sherman sent a runner to 2nd Lieutenant George Codria with instructions for his platoon to move out. Sherman decided to stay at the company command post instead of accompanying his platoon. As Codria's platoon approached Pollock, who was standing on the road with a runner and a radio man, they didn't immediately recognise each other in the dark. Codria identified himself and relayed that his platoon had been ordered to the sand spit to reinforce the line and push the Japanese back. Pollock, recognising Codria by his voice, confirmed, That's correct, get going. Meanwhile, a much larger wave of Japanese soldiers began to stream across the sandbar. Machine gunners Jack Rivers and Bull Warren opened fire once more. However, 
This time they were surprised by machine gun fire coming from across the river as the Japanese provided covering fire, something they hadn't done in previous charges. To the left of Rivers, Corporal Jim Olive and his 37mm gun crew fired canister shells at the advancing Japanese, but they too came under heavy counterfire from the enemy machine guns positioned on the eastern bank of the Nakagawa. The enemy's bullets even bounced off the steel shield of their gun. Nearby, Corporal Glenn Campbell, the leader of a nearby 37mm gun squad, was frustrated. His gun had been knocked out earlier, and he had been ordered to defend the command post rather than return to the fighting. Despite the urgency of the renewed Japanese assault, he was commanded to stay put. On the front lines, 2nd Lieutenant John Williams's 3rd platoon continued to battle the Japanese soldiers who had successfully crossed the sand spit. Using BRs, rifles and grenades, they managed to hold off the assault, even as their comrades engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The men of E Company took note with relief that the Japanese machine gun fire was mostly directed at the heavy weapons emplacements, sparing the individual riflemen. In a foxhole directly across from the sand spit, Brady Wadsworth kept firing his bar at the advancing Japanese. Nearby, Dean Wilson and Peavesita Ray Roberts, sharing a foxhole, were also engaged in the fight. Wilson's bar jammed at a critical moment, and undeterred, he grabbed a machete he kept in the foxhole. Emerging from cover, Wilson attacked three Japanese soldiers, killing them in brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat after his comrade Roberts was shot and killed in front of him. In another part of the line, Privates George Terzai and Bill Mosner climbed out of their foxhole and began hurling grenades at the approaching Japanese while firing their rifles. They were determined to hold the enemy at bay until reinforcements could arrive at daylight. They were soon directed to get a nearby 37mm gun operational. As they moved toward the silent gun, they encountered their fellow Marine, Dean Wilson, crawling over dead Japanese soldiers. Terzai and Mosner reached the unoccupied gun emplacement, which had belonged to Campbell's squad, and found three canister shells on the floor. After loading the gun, Mosner fired one round into the coconut grove, another down the beach, and the third into a group of about twenty Japanese soldiers crossing the sandbar, decimating them. After that, they resumed fighting with their rifles. Upstream, 1st Lieutenant Magozo Maruyama and his 3rd Company were positioned along the eastern bank of the Nakagawa, waiting for the order to cross. Maruyama had observed Higuchi's and Chiba's companies attacking across the sand spit and watched as Komatsu's machine guns roared into action, providing cover for the assault. However, Maruyama had concerns about the depth of the water at their crossing point. Once Chiba's company moved out, Maruyama gave the order for his men to begin crossing the river. At the crossing point along the Nakagawa River, Colonel Ichiki, still hopeful of mounting a successful attack, had called for volunteers from his headquarters to join First Lieutenant Maruyama and the engineers in the crossing. When no one stepped forward, Ichiki angrily demanded, Nobody! Nobody wants to join! Finally, Sergeant Sadanobu Okada, despite lacking combat experience, volunteered, expecting this might be a fatal mission. Ichiki expressed some surprise at Okada's offer, but allowed him to prepare to swim the river with three other men who then volunteered. Okada left behind most of his equipment, carrying only two grenades, a pistol and a sword, while the others carried rifles, bayonets and minimal ammunition. However, just before they could begin, Ichiki halted the volunteers, waiting to see if the machine guns under Komatsu's command could suppress the marines' fire on Maruyama's men. Okada, watching the engineers struggle under the relentless marine fire, wasn't optimistic, describing the bullets sweeping into them like a broom. Meanwhile, 2nd Lieutenant George Kodrea had been ordered by Lieutenant Colonel Pollock to move his first platoon to the mouth of the Tanaru River to reinforce E Company. As Kodrea's platoon advanced along the dirt road, they were suddenly caught in a deadly crossfire from Japanese machine guns positioned across the spit and from their right. Realising they could not continue forward as a single column, Kodria ordered his men to crouch down while he formulated a plan. Deciding to split his platoon, an unconventional move in marine doctrine, Kodria took the lead squad forward himself 
and ordered his platoon guide, Jim Hancock, to take another squad to the right to protect the flank. Moving as low as possible, Codria's group reached a position just to the left of the sand spit. In the meantime, Hancock's group secured the right flank, while platoon sergeant Charlie Spakes and the third squad remained in reserve about 50 yards behind Codria. As the platoon advanced, they came under fire again, but this time it was Codria's turn to inspire his men, leading from the front despite the marine doctrine that typically discouraged officers from taking the lead in such circumstances. Corporal Joe Faso, leading the rifle squad behind Codria, had recently returned from the hospital and was resuming his duties from PFC. Jack Shea, who had temporarily filled in. Faso's men, including Privates Andy Brodecki and Tom McLean, set up their bar on an embankment overlooking the Tanaru. McLean threw hand grenades to support Brodecki, who unleashed fire from the bar at the advancing Japanese forces. They could see a Japanese officer leading his men with a sword, charging at 2nd Lieutenant John Williams's E Company platoon on the western bank. Private Richard W. Bill Harding, who had orders to hold his fire until the Japanese were close, waited as they came into view, appearing to him as small black shapes. When they were close enough, Harding and his squad threw grenades, causing a massive explosion and scattering the Japanese attackers. As the survivors panicked, Harding's squad opened fire with their Springfield rifles, but more Japanese kept coming, firing their Arisaka rifles and throwing grenades. Harding moved to a nearby foxhole and continued shooting until he heard a familiar voice. Jack Shea, his assistant squad leader, was calling for help after a struggle with a Japanese soldier. Shea had been firing a Thompson submachine gun but had been wounded in the leg when it jammed, forcing him into hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. After managing to clear the gun's jam, Shea shot his attacker point-blank and crawled back to Codria's position. As Harding returned to his own foxhole, Tracers from enemy fire flew overhead. A flare illuminated the scene, revealing a Japanese soldier crawling toward Harding's position. Realising he would have to fight for the foxhole, Harding grabbed his rifle and, when the Japanese was close enough, struck him with the bayonet. He jumped on the soldier and strangled him until the Japanese went limp and died. Barely able to catch his breath, Harding noticed another enemy crawling nearby. He stabbed this second Japanese soldier in the stomach with his bayonet, but before he could free the blade, there was a sudden explosion. The blast sent Harding flying, leaving his hip and leg injured. As he lay wounded, he saw more Japanese grenades and mortar shells landing around him and his comrades. Mortar fire and hand grenades rained down on Kodria's position. Harding, wounded and in shock, saw one Marine motionless nearby, seemingly dead while another groaned weakly in response to his calls. The situation was growing increasingly desperate as the Japanese continued their relentless assault on the embattled marines at the Tenaru. Lieutenant George Codria had been wounded almost immediately when the Japanese barrage began, hit by shrapnel from what he believed was a knee mortar. The shrapnel tore into his left arm in two places above the elbow, but despite his injuries and the pain, he was determined to continue directing his platoon's operations. Around 4.30am, Codria, covered in dirt, blood and his clothes in tatters, was in bad shape. Seeing him in this state, Privates Andy Brodecki and Tom McLean ran to his aid. Brodecki tore what was left of his jacket to fashion bandages and apply a tourniquet to stop the bleeding. Meanwhile, one of the mortar shells had exploded close to Corporal Robert Spillane and his squad. This squad was part of Platoon Sergeant Spakes's group, moving forward to reinforce Codria's position. The sudden shock of the shell left Spillane's men slow to react, with many frozen in place. Private Robert Flick, wounded in the right knee, initially considered retreating but changed his mind when a comrade beside him was hit in the throat by shrapnel. Spillane, desperate to get his squad moving, shouted at them to advance, but they remained motionless. It was only when Codria, ignoring his own injury, ran back to the front of Spillane's squad, brandishing his pistol and ordering them forward, that the squad finally got up and moved. Once forward, Spillane's squad formed a skirmish line, dropping to the ground near the beach. The men, led by assistant squad leader PFC Jim Wilson, felt exposed 
like sitting ducks. Frantic, they dug into the sand for cover as machine gun fire from the east swept over them. With each shot from their spring fields, they tried to retaliate against the Japanese. Suddenly, Wilson was hit in the lower back by what felt like a burning sting. Several other men in his squad were also hit. He resisted the impulse to retreat, knowing the fate of Private Russell Butterweck, who had stood up and been instantly cut down by machine gun fire. Meanwhile, the other half of Codria's platoon, led by Jim Hancock, was moving up the right flank. Corporal John Oliveri's squad was firing across the river at the Japanese attempting to cross. During this, Private Vinnie Rogers, a beloved member of the squad, was killed by a machine gun bullet. Some Japanese had even infiltrated Hancock's position. One slashed the back of Hancock's shirt with a bayonet. Private Jim Boston intervened, placing himself between the Japanese soldier and Hancock. Boston parried a bayonet thrust and then killed the enemy with the butt of his rifle. Nearby, Corporal George Parker's 37mm gun crew was trying to hold their position against the relentless assault. Positioned in a bunker of coconut logs and sandbags, they were firing canister shots across the river to sweep the Japanese positions. Despite their efforts, they were under constant attack from Japanese machine gun fire and mortar rounds. Bursts of fire ricocheted off their gun shield, while knee mortar shells and grenades tore into their sandbags. Parker and his crew anxiously awaited daylight, hoping they could better target the Japanese once they had more visibility. To Parker's left, Lee Diamond, Jack Rivers and Al Schmid were manning a .30 caliber machine gun, but their position had been revealed by the tracer fire from their gun. As enemy fire struck the pit, Rivers stood to spot the incoming fire, while Diamond directed the return fire by tapping Schmid, who relayed the signals to Rivers. They noticed that another machine gun position, manned by Bull Warren's crew to their right, had gone silent, possibly indicating that Warren's crew had been killed. At that moment, a burst of machine gun fire hit Rivers in the forehead, killing him instantly. Schmid, reacting quickly, took over the gunner position, while Diamond shifted to loading the .30 caliber belts. The two men, working seamlessly despite the chaos, continued to hold the line. Using his left hand, Al Schmid coolly traversed the machine gun back and forth, firing at the Japanese who were attempting to cross the river in multiple locations. He could feel the impact of his bullets as they cut through the water, hitting their targets. The moonlight illuminated the wading Japanese, making them easy targets when they came within 50 yards of Schmid's position. However, one of the Japanese machine gunners managed to land a burst through the water jacket of Schmid's Browning, just inches from his face. Water from the punctured jacket sprayed over his lap and chest. The gun began to crackle and sputter, but surprisingly, it continued to function despite being water-cooled and having overheated from continuous fire. To Schmid's right, Private Bob Leckie and Private Lewis Chuckler Jurgens of Lieutenant Hugh Corrigan's 1st Machine Gun Platoon were alternating turns firing their own Browning machine gun. Tracer rounds flew towards them from across the river, seemingly homing in on their position. Chuckler, we'd better move. They won't be able to get the range that way, Leckie suggested. Jurgens pulled the tripod over himself while Leckie supported the gun on his chest, and they carefully retreated. Once they had relocated, they set up the gun and resumed firing from their unprotected spot on the ground. They couldn't see the Japanese in the darkness so they aimed and fired toward the sounds they heard. After about 15 minutes, they moved to yet another position, continuing this routine of moving and firing throughout the battle. Further upstream, two other H Company machine gun squads from Sergeant Cross's section of Lieutenant Bill Wharf's 3rd Platoon had strict orders not to fire unless they saw Japanese cross the river directly in front of them, Firing downstream was too risky, as it might hit their own men positioned to the left. Soon they saw Japanese troops emerging from the grove, moving towards the river at a walking pace. Private Ed Manning, the 18-year-old gunner of Corporal Perry Fridley's squad to the right of Corporal Bill Wright's machine gun emplacement, opened fire when flares illuminated the Japanese positions. He felt his fire was effective, as no Japanese attempted to cross in front of his position. With only sandbags in front of their guns and no overhead protection, 
the men in both squads were wary of any Japanese who might make it across the river. To Manning's left, facing Wright's machine gun, some Japanese attempted to swim across the river, but Wright's crew fired on them, forcing them to retreat back to their side of the river. At the far right end of the 2nd Battalion's defensive line, where the river bent, Private John Joseph stood watch at the water's edge. A runner for G Company's weapons platoon, Joseph had been assigned to a listening post earlier in the evening. He now heard a noise in the water. Slowly, a man with a rifle appeared, attempting to climb the bank. Joseph, rising from his sitting position at the base of a tree, struck the Japanese soldier in the face with the butt of his rifle. The enemy soldier fell back into the water and drifted away. Excited, Joseph woke up his buddy, Ed Shorty Fahey, who was sharing listening post duty with him. As they peered across the river, a match was struck. They fired their rifles at what they assumed was a careless Japanese soldier, but a Japanese machine gun crew quickly responded with a long burst of fire. After the exchange, it became quiet again, and no more Japanese were seen coming across at their far end location. To the right of Joseph, beyond the far end of the 2nd Battalion's defence line, Private Bob Fincher, a member of one of the four squads in 2nd Lieutenant John Speakes's 2nd Machine Gun Platoon, D Company, also heard Japanese across the river in the grove. When flares illuminated the area, he could see them moving to their left, having reached the edge of the riverbank on the opposite side of the Tanaru. As Fincher began firing his .30 calibre heavy machine gun, the Japanese hunkered down and started firing back. The crew of the other Browning, paired with Finchers, joined in the crossfire. Despite their efforts, some of the Japanese managed to get into the river, attempting to cross over to Finchers' side. While it was firing, Finchers' gun took a hit in the jacket, and the water soon started boiling inside. His assistant gunner, PFC Joe Fontaine, passed Fincher the spare barrel. As Fincher was changing the barrel, another flare burst overhead. Fincher turned and saw a Japanese soldier entering his gun emplacement. Overcoming his initial shock, he reacted by hitting the unarmed man with the old barrel several times, until he was sure his nemesis was dead. On the right flank of 1st Lieutenant Komatsu's machine gun company, Sergeant Masatoshi Mei's squad of ten men was continuously firing from its Type 92 7.7 mm heavy machine gun into American positions in support of the Higuchi and Chiba Company's attempts to cross over the sandbar at the mouth of the Nakagawa. The other three squads of 2nd Lieutenant Kosaburo Osada's platoon, led by Corporals Nakamura, Kadoguchi and Hanada, were also directing their fire across the Nakagawa when they made out the silhouettes of enemy soldiers. In the centre of Komatsu's line of machine gunners, leading Private Naide Yoshimasa, in Sergeant Naoyuki Yamada's squad of 2nd Lieutenant Masao Inagaki's platoon of two machine gun squads, was shocked when American machine gunners returned their fire like madmen, spraying bullets, evidently canister, all around their position. Immediately, Lieutenant Inagaki took a direct hit and keeled over without a word. Sergeant Yamada now took charge of the platoon. Positioned right next to Yoshimasa, Lieutenant Komatsu was untouched and continued directing his company's fire. Then Yoshimasa himself was hit in the buttocks and forced to abandon his machine gun. He was carried to a depression in the ground where medics could treat him. On the far left of Komatsu's line of machine guns, the two squads of 2nd Lieutenant Zenji Ito began firing on the big gun across the river from them, in support of 1st Lieutenant Maruyama's company of 105 men to their right, who were preparing to plunge into the Nakagawa. Immediately the gunners began receiving devastating counterfire, mainly canister. No! Five hit, number six forward! Ito yelled. Then Ito himself was hit too, his voice ordering the fresh crews forward fading out. Both guns were now knocked out of action. Maruyama's men were also met by a wave of fire as they tried to cross the river. As in the other platoons, the 30 members of Lieutenant Hiroshi Miura's first platoon were taking hits as they struggled to get across the unexpectedly deep river. In the middle, the water was up to their chests, forcing them to dog paddle to make progress. All the while, they were the targets of concentrated fire from the other side. 
Leading Private Naokichi Nakayama, third squad leader in Miura's platoon, saw several of his comrades trying to take shelter behind an abandoned American amphibious tank in the river near the Japanese side. Nakayama concluded it was hopeless to continue trying to ford the river and decided to head back with his squad. There, on the eastern bank of the Nakagawa, he and his men reassembled and reorganised before once more plunging into the river in a renewed attempt. But with hand grenades flying in their direction and exploding among them, they all pulled back once more, still short some 50 to 60 metres from the American positions on the other bank. By the time of the third attempt, there were only about ten men left in Miura's platoon, including only one non-com, Nakayama. Leading his skeleton platoon in a final effort, Miura was hit in the head. Throwing back his head, he sank down in the water. Now in charge of what remained of Miura's platoon, Nakayama realised they were in a hopeless situation. He ordered the remaining three or four men in the platoon to turn back and regain their bank of the river. There, the survivors found a hollow and took cover in it as the battle raged on. He wondered about the fate of the company commander, Maruyama, as well as his other two platoon leaders, 2nd Lieutenant Shigenori Nae and Shoichi Matsuo, and the men under them. Did any of them make it across the river and penetrate marine positions? Unable to capture or even silence the big gun almost opposite the river fording point, Several of Maruyama's men from a squad of Lieutenant Matsuo's platoon carried their Type 99 light machine gun into the water behind the disabled American amphibious tank and climbed up on it with their gun and cartridge boxes of detached ammo magazines, each holding a curved strip of 30 rounds of 7.7mm bullets. After setting the Nambu light up on its bipod, they began firing at the emplacement of the enemy gun that had been causing such heavy casualties among the men of Maruyama and Goto. The inability of American crossfire to zero in on their indistinguishable position in the darkness, abetted by the flash hider on their gun, was allowing them to continue firing throughout the night. Downstream, near the mouth of the Nakagawa, First Lieutenant Hideo Goto, commanding officer of the engineer company of Ichiki's detachment, had observed the devastating fire from the big gun that was creating such havoc among Maruyama's men trying to reach the other side of the Nakagawa. Earlier, he had ordered his second and fourth platoons to join the attack force of the Higuchi and Chiba companies crossing over the mouth of the river, but he still had 20 men of his headquarters section and 40 more of his third platoon available to join the battle. Now he ordered them to join him and head upstream to attack the marines firing across the river at Maruyama's men in the water and capture their troublesome gun. But when Goto's men arrived at the location on the left bank of the Nakagawa from where they intended to cross over, they were met by a hail of bullets. Superior Private Shimizu's flamethrower took a hit, fuel oil spurting out and blackening his face. Then the headquarters section chief, Warrant Officer Akira Takausa, was hit too, killed instantly. It was just before dawn when the men of Goto's 3rd platoon, led by the company commander himself, descended into the river. As soon as they reached mid-river, they were spotted by the marines, who began throwing hand grenades at them. PFC Takeshi Makabe and about 20 others clustered around Goto. The water was too deep to wade, so they began to swim. But now enemy fire was coming down on them like in a rainstorm. Many of the men were hit, including Makabe through the shoulder. Lieutenant Goto was dead, killed by one of the grenades thrown at them. As he lay wounded in the water, Makabe realised that their plan to seize the gun had proven futile. Turning back, he managed to make it to the shelter afforded by the abandoned amphibious tank, where he was joined by PFC, Kichiro Sugawara. When the American fire let up a bit, they left their refuge and climbed back up the riverbank. There they found men of Maruyama's third company. They were reassembling behind Makabe and reloading their Arisaka rifles in preparation for another attempt to cross the Nakagawa after several failed attempts. At the 1st Marines Regimental Command Post, Colonel Cates, at 0347, decided to change the fire mission of the 75mm pack howitzers of his 3rd Battalion, 11th Marines, following his initial 0320 order to put down an artillery concentration at the narrowest part of the sandbar. 
Cates was worried that the initial target area, as pre-registered based on First Lieutenant John Frothingham's survey, was too close to his men defending the mouth of the Tanaru. Shells would be falling within less than 100 yards of them. Now he suspected, correctly, that Japanese were massing behind the opposite east bank of the Tanaru several hundred yards upstream, possibly bringing up reserves. He got on the phone to the executive officer of the 11th Marines 3rd Battalion at some 3,500 yards west of the Tanaru in the best position of the battalions of the 11th Marines to lay down artillery fire on the Japanese. After being connected to Major George Wilson, Cates ordered him to shift the fire mission 300 yards to the right and 100 yards down. It was about 0400 when the new order reached Sergeant Bob Askey, section head for one of the four howitzers of I-Battery, via the battery's executive officer, First Lieutenant John Bradbury. Fire mission, azimuth, 828, range 3,500, battery 10 rounds. The firing order also went out to First Lieutenant Gerald Russell, executive officer of H Battery. ASCII and the other three section chiefs of I Battery reported back to Bradbury that they were ready to fire. The number two men on each howitzer had rammed in a 75mm high explosive shell, and now on Bradbury's command, fire! The number one men yanked the lanyards. In just three minutes, beginning at 0403, 40 shells from I Battery crashed down on the Japanese, each taking 8.6 seconds to reach the target. Ten minutes later, the four howitzers fired another 40 rounds. But were any rounds falling short and hitting the defenders on the west bank of the river? Sergeant Bob White at the command post with Major Wilson had received word that, We're firing on our own people. But Wilson discounted the report and ordered firing to continue. Major Bob Lucky, with Colonel Cates at the 1st Marines command post, also had received messages from the line that the 3rd Battalion's shells were falling on the Marines on the West Bank, but Cates concluded that the fire allegedly falling short was actually from 50mm Japanese knee mortars. In their two-man foxhole some 200 to 300 yards upstream from the mouth of the Tanaru, Pets Claude Crotty and Harold Punchy Legraf sometime after 0300, had noticed a lot of milling around across the river on the opposite bank and also heard a lot of excited jabbering in a foreign language. Two of the 50 men of H Company's mortar platoon assigned the night watch under 2nd Lieutenant Don Wheaton, Crotty and Legraf were suddenly bathed in the eerie green light of a flare shot up from the opposite side. Then all up and down the defence line of the mortarmen, machine gun fire sprayed around them ripping past them into palm trees behind their line. Crotty figured that the machine guns on the opposite side were providing cover for Japanese intending to cross the river to attack them, and he was right. He shouted to his foxhole buddy to get ready for hand-to-hand -hand combat when the machine gun fire let up. Sure enough, shadowy figures heading towards the defence line in a peculiar crouched position were climbing up the bank towards their position after having forded the river. Furiously working their springfields, they yanked back the bolt after each shot, rammed it back with another round, and fired again. In another foxhole thirty yards back of the Tanaru's right bank, and eight to ten feet above the river level, facing the abandoned LVT alligator, another of the mortarmen, PFC Clyde Lucas, was also the target of the sweeping machine gun fire, but fortunately for him, the bullets were hitting the ground just below his foxhole, then he saw the Japanese coming too, wading across the river under the moonlit night sky that was broken from time to time by fast-moving clouds. A sharpshooter from Tennessee, Lucas was excited to be in a good position to pick the Japanese off as they climbed up the riverbank. Those who succeeded in approaching him were felled with single shots from his 03 rifle, but some 15 feet to the left of Lucas, a screaming Japanese officer was wielding his samurai sword against Sea Plull. Charlie Carp, when, from about 20 feet, Crotty shot him in the chest as the assailant was silhouetted against the sky. It was too late. In his earlier swipes, the Japanese had stabbed Carp through the face, neck and stomach, then had run his sword twice through Carp's shoulder. Earlier, Pershut Ed de Jeanville had attempted to shoot the officer before he swung his sword at de Jeanville a second time, but his safety was on, 
and all he could do was parry the blow. The first lunge had left Dijonville with a badly cut leg. Even more disturbing to Lucas and the others was friendly artillery fire falling on their line. While they could ascertain that 75 mm shells were landing on the other side of the river where the Japanese were evidently bunched up, at least three exploded among the mortarmen, so close that we were covered in dirt, Pussett James Donahue later recorded in his diary. Nearby, PFCs. Arthur Atwood and Barney Sterling were less fortunate. A shell landed directly in the foxhole they were sharing about twenty feet to the right of Lucas. He heard at least six as they were fired from pack howitzers behind the line. With the shell fire sweeping to the left, Lucas figured the next round would fall on him. As a mortar man, he knew about such sweeping fire. But it was to his great relief that he realised seconds later that no more rounds were landing in the line. Right below Jim Donahue's position, some Japanese had succeeded in getting a Nambu light machine gun across the river and had set it up preparatory to firing. PFC Len Beer and PFC Art Dinan spotted the machine gun crew in a drainage ditch just across from them, but it was too dark to see them clearly as the Japanese opened fire. When it was a bit lighter, Beer and Dinan could hear them talking. The two mortarmen climbed out of their foxhole, Dignan with his Springfield rifle and Beer holding a grenade he had picked up two weeks earlier. Moving to a favourable position, Beer tossed the grenade into the ditch. After the blast, the only response they received was moans and groans. When Dignan returned to the foxhole, he realised that Beer had not joined him and was still near the ditch. Beer yelled to Dignan that he'd been hit in the back by fire from the machine gun and couldn't move. Hurrying to Beer, Dignan pulled him back to a place behind a small embankment that offered some protection. Dignan feared that dropping Beer into the hole might hurt him further, so he decided it was better to wait for a corpsman to arrive and handle the situation. Beer asked for water, and Dignan held his canteen for him to drink. It soon became clear that Beer was more seriously wounded than Dignan had initially realised, and it was a while before a corpsman could reach them. About two hours into the fighting, Donahue was relieved to see reinforcements arriving. However, only ten minutes after setting up two Light Point three zero caliber air-cooled Brownings, the two crews were shot up by Japanese machine gunners across the river. Donahue attributed this to their lack of proper cover, not below the deck. At this point, H Company Platt Sergeant John Muth grabbed one of the unmanned machine guns and began moving down the line, firing bursts across the river and shifting positions as needed. A Japanese machine gun that Donahue and others suspected was set up on the abandoned LVT in the river began throwing plenty of lead their way. PFC Verbon Joe Sanders, a barman, moved up behind Muth and asked Donahue if there was enough room in his foxhole for him. Concerned that Sanders would be killed if he stayed exposed, Donahue agreed, even though his foxhole was already full with him and Murray Battles. Sanders slid into the hole as Donahue and Muth continued firing. When Donahue later asked Battles why Sanders wasn't firing his bar, Muth slowly replied, He's dead. Donahue checked Sanders's pulse and found none. Sanders had been hit in the head and chest by the Japanese machine gunner and was already badly wounded when he had called out for help. 